from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you all for coming. Uh, sorry about the delay. Uh, my name is Mohanad Salhi, and on behalf of the African Middle Eastern Division and our chief, Dr. Mary Jane Deeb, I would like to welcome you all to our event. Uh, just a few words about our division. Our division is divided into three sections. The African section, which deals with Sub-Saharan Africa. The Hebraic section, which deals with uh, Hebraica and Judaica worldwide. And the Near East section, which deals from uh, Kazan in the north, to Khartoum in the south, Kashgar in the east, to Casablanca in the west. So as you can see, we have our hands busy. We deal with about 78 different countries and about 35 different languages. So I would urge all of you who are interested in our areas to come here and do your research. I would also like to uh, urge you to check out our Four Corners blog and check out our Facebook, like us on Facebook. Um, uh, we also have a number of uh, noontime programs like this. And um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Ms. Nawal Kawar, who is going to introduce our speaker. Well, thank you all for coming. Um, I'm so glad and thrilled to have two dynamic speakers. Layla Haddad is parking, as you all know, and Maggie Schmidt. I'm going to introduce <laughs> Maggie Schmidt first. Maggie Schmidt is a writer, researcher, translator, educator, and social activist. She works in various media, writing, production, photography, and video, using everyday life as a way to approach complex political and social realities. She co-authored the acclaimed documentary, Cookbook, The Gaza Kitchen, A Palestinian Culinary Journey, which has reached an astonishingly large and diverse audience with this peculiar blend of intimate anecdotes, political analysis, and local food ways, which is the topic of this program. The hybrid approach, mixing scholarship with fresh first-person narratives is characteristic of Maggie's work. She was one of the creators of Precarious a la Dariba, am I pronouncing it right? A Madrid-based project that used innovative methods of collective storytelling and cartography to chart the changing relationship between work and life for young women in the city, creating not only a much cited book, but film, and also knitting together with a network of mutual support in the process. In the same spirit, she initiated a project that brought together feminists from various Middle Eastern countries to visit each other's spaces and conduct in-depth interviews with each other about political strategies and personal lives, creating a small archive of stories and strong network of allies. Ms. Schmidt has worked extensively on the issue of migration and discrimination domestic work and the economy of care, and the uses of space in the city. She has participated in various documentaries and social research projects, as well as grassroots initiatives addressing these issues, both at home, in Madrid, and in broader European networks. Recently, her work has focused largely on food and music. In addition to the Gaza Kitchen and the other ongoing research on the, political, on the politics of food. Do we have politics on food? You can elaborate on that. She did research and production for the collaborative musical project Beyond Digital in Morocco, looking at the contemporary Berber folk revival and its relationship to digital technology and creating the video elements of the related app Sufi plugins. She might like to elaborate on the project later on. 
Ms. Schmidt has also taught in a number of contexts, an author, an outdoor, sorry, an outdoor education program in Lebanon, courses on Mediterranean history for university students in Madrid, courses on post-colonialism and feminist theory in community-run continuing education programs. She is a member of the group Zenobia Translations which specializes in the translation and interpretation of political and scholarly work. Ms. Maggie Schmidt grew up in Miami, Florida, and has lived in Spain for most of her adult life, with extended periods of time also in Lebanon, Turkey, and Morocco. She holds a BA from Harvard in literature and has conducted advanced graduate studies in social anthropology and Mediterranean studies at the Universidad Autonoma de Madrid. She now makes her home in a mountain village near Madrid, where she lives with her partner, Yuan, and her two young sons. Layla El Haddad is an award-winning Palestinian author, social activist, policy analyst, and journalist. She frequently speaks on the situation in Gaza, the intersection of food and politics, and contemporary Islam. She has written for numerous newspapers and magazines, including the Baltimore Sun, Washington Post, International Herald Tribune, The New Statesman, The Daily Star, Le Monde Diplomatique, and has appeared on many international broadcasting networks, including NPR and CNN. She is the author of Gaza Mom, Palestine, Politics, Parenting, and Everything in Between, and co-author of the critical acclaimed The Gaza Kitchen, A Palestinian Culinary Journey, which was the recipient of Best Arab Cuisine Book, awarded for the Gourmand Magazine, and a finalist at the 2013 Memo Palestine Book Awards. Ms. Al Haddad has lectured to student groups academic faculty, community groups, and nonprofits around the U.S. and the world on topics ranging from Gaza's culinary history, the situation in Palestine, as well as her own personal journey as a former Palestinian blogger and journalist. In her spare time, she volunteers in her own community with Syrian refugees relief and resettlement efforts in Maryland, as well as advocating for Palestinian rights and equality through her involvement with various community and national groups, including the U.S. Campaign for Palestinian Rights and the American Muslim for Palestine. From 2003 to 2007, Ms. Al Haddad was the Gaza correspondent for Al Jazeera English and a regular contributor to the BBC World Service, during which time she covers such events as the Gaza disengagement and the 2006 Palestinian elections. Even though we are mentioning all these programs she's involved with, I like to tell the audience that we are not going to get involved in any controversial topics or political questions. Please, we don't get involved in politics. During this time, she co-directed two Gaza-based documentaries, including the award-winning tunnel trade. She is also a policy advisor with Al Shabaka, the Palestinian Policy Network. Through her work as a writer and documentarian, she provides much needed insight into the human experience of the region. She was recently featured in CNN program Parts Unknown with celebrity chef and gastronome Anthony Bourdain in the episode titled Jerusalem, the West Bank, and Gaza as his guide in the Gaza Strip, marking the first time a mainstream American audience has seen Gaza in this ordinary light. <laughs> Ms. Al Haddad received her BA in Political Science and Comparative Area Studies with a minor in History from Duke University in 2000 and her Master in Public Policy from the Harvard Kennedy School in 2002. She was the recipient of the Clinton Scholarship and the Barbara Jordan Award for Women's Leadership. She is also the recipient of the American Friends Services Committee Inspiration for Hope Award and the Arab American Anti-Discrimination Committee's Literary Leadership Awards. <clears throat> 
Born in Kuwait to a Palestinian parents from Gaza, she currently lives in Clarksville, Maryland with her husband, Yasin Dawood, and their three children. When not containing the blissful chaos of her household, you will frequently find her poking around other people's kitchen in a forest or on a basketball court. Without further ado, Ms. Maggie Schmidt and Layla Haddad, please. All right. Yeah, well. we apologize for those really extensive and long bios. We really didn't think they were necessary, but we were, <laughs> <laughs> we were pressed and told we have to have a, anyway. The, the, yeah. the biography is always an embarrassing moment, yeah. but. Um, so welcome, thank you very much for being here. Again, so sorry for the delay. Uh, as you've heard, we're here to speak about this book that we published initially almost five years ago. Uh, the second edition has just been released by Just World Books. It's a, uh, it's a much larger, more extensive edition with uh, more photography, additional recipes, et cetera. So we're very, very pleased to, to see this finally in print on nice quality paper and everything. Um, so, so, and delighted to, to speak about it to you all today. The project was born Basically, uh, each of us from our different angles, from our different life experiences, from our different relationship with the region, uh, as a response to what people usually imagine or know about Gaza, which is sort of this. this these are the, the typical images that one sees. Anonymous, distant, always shown either as as a hapless victim or as a somehow dangerous aggressor. Um, and this doesn't resonate, certainly for Leila, who is from Gaza with her experience of the place, didn't resonate with my brief experience of the place uh, on an initial visit that I made in 2009. Uh, and for both of us, what really grabbed our attention about Gaza, what we felt like was an important story to tell about Gaza is not, and, and yes, now while we will, we will avoid the sort of overt political polemic, but it's impossible to speak about the Gaza Strip without in some way speaking about its political situation because it's so overwhelming. Yeah, that's like that's all there is. There should be a hot, cold button like the closer, <laughs> the closer <laughs> we get to controversy. <laughs> um, but, but for us, the question was to, precisely by writing a book a cookbook, a sort of ethnographic documentary cookbook, was to avoid the sort of big discourses of official politics and look at daily life, ordinary life. How are people surviving? How are households staying sane? How are people continuing with their lives every day uh, in extraordinary and truly terrible circumstances? With, with the understanding that all that stuff exists, right? It's not in a vacuum, obviously. Um, but kind of the idea was, how do we tell this story in a different way, sort of the same old story, but in a different way, using a different lens, a lens that is, you know, a, a more meaningful, that is more humanizing, that is more dignifying for, you know, uh, the people that we were. The and it's helped. Of this. I mean, the interesting yeah. thing about the reception of this book is that it clearly helps an audience not familiar with mm -hmm. Gaza to understand this place in its everyday humanity, but also. For the people we interviewed, for the people we talked to there, uh, they've really embraced the book as a representation of their place and their lives that they recognize in a way that most of the sort of mediatic representations of Gaza, they don't recognize their daily life in that because it's often pictures like this. So what we always say is that we were sort of trying to sneak in any one of those anonymous block windows and, and get into the inside of households, the inside of daily life, and begin talking from, from something as, as tactile, as material, as human, as everyday as, for example, the, the baking of bread or the cooking of, of the daily meal. Which is often where the real stories get told and where the histories are perpetuated, right? And where ultimately dignity is retained. Uh, it's this sort of one safe space that we frequently like to say people have sort of, when everything else seems sort of uh, out of your control, you, you do exercise an element of control in how you bake your bread or what ingredients you're using to purchase to make the, you know, the food that you've always known or, or what stories you are sharing and, and meals you're making. Uh, and so it's liberating in that sense. And as we, 
as we undertook the, the field work for this, which was several months of fairly intensive field work, talking to different individuals who were incredibly generous, uh, inviting us into their homes. We tried to get a sort of a cross-section of Gazan society, which goes from very humble households, rural households, to very, uh, a, a, an urban elite of, of very accomplished people and, uh, and wealthy households. We tried to cover a whole spectrum. Um, discussing with them, basically asking for recipes, talking about uh, family recipes and family uh, techniques for cooking. But of course, as you all surely know, recipes are never just how do you make a given food. They always drag along with them. On the one hand, family stories, histories, where do things come from, what do you remember? I remember, my mother-in-law taught me this, but she said that it, so you, you begin to pull on long threads of history, and those long threads are invariably connected also to the circumstances of, of people's lives, how they've changed, when they've moved, when they've been exiled, when they've been pushed from one place to another, the uh, sort of vicissitudes and ups and downs of their economic conditions, their household conditions. So all of these stories kind of come along with the recipes. And, and we do remind people over and over again in the book that, uh, again, we, it's all about sort of getting beyond these caricatures and, and getting a true, deeper understanding, not only of, of the people themselves, but of the place, right? And we remind people that Gaza historically is a very rich, is a very rich place. It was a trading city. It was a main uh, port along the Mediterranean. Uh, it was a place through which, uh, you know, all major caravan routes and spice uh, routes passed, including the frankincense route, and on and on. So it has a very unique and, and storied place in history, uh, and it's very difficult to remember that, obviously in the context of everything that we know uh, is happening these days. But it's very easy to remember this when you're looking at the recipes, right. and this is, again, kind of we, we kind of felt like we had stumbled yeah. upon a secret wormhole, a secret door into a different way of telling history, because if you simply smell the rice cooking, how could you not know that this had been an uh, entrepot of, of the spice trade? How could, so, so in the same way that recipes tell us family histories mm. and therefore economic histories and therefore political histories, they also tell us sort of great global histories. You know, the fact of all of these spices here being integrated, and now, I mean, in the last months, we've been doing sort of more historic research and the resonances of Gazan cuisine with medieval Abbasi cooking. The, the same, we can find these same recipes uh, in some ways, Gaza. Sometimes with the same names, although hmm. somewhat different ingredients, yeah. So, so it's also a, a kind of a, a backdoor access to a broad historical spectrum of, of the place, its, its relationship, as Leila says, in, in the spice roots, in the trade roots, uh, its relationship to different uh, courtly cuisines and different sort of power structures over, oh, over history. Ar Arabian caravans would obviously pass through, or maybe it's not common knowledge, but from Arabia they would then go to Gaza, and it was known that the, you know, grandfather's, uh, the, the pr grandfather of the, the Prophet Muhammad uh, was, died there, and so on and so forth. Uh, and it was, this is very different, we should mention, than elsewhere uh, in historic Palestine. The cuisine differs remarkably, uh, and there's certain components that are altogether absent, that are present in Gaza, that are altogether absent in other parts of Palestine. And this was what I think was so interesting to us and to so many people. Why did this happen? Why was this the case? How, you know, how did it come about, and why was it preserved uh, through the years? So the strategy of the, of the book is to tell, provide the recipes, and of course, that in itself is a is an undertaking because the translation from the oral history and the sort of folk knowledge of you take a little bit of this and just enough of that, and you do it, and you and you saute it until it's done. And then we would say like, like how, how, but how do you translate? How, that? It's like, what are you a moron? Why do you need me to explain to you? Like, you, this you should know, just be common done, knowledge. You should done. understand how this is done. Yes. And we all have grandmothers. We all yeah. know that, that that's how how <laughs> how cooking is transmitted. But then translating that kind of knowledge into the written kind of knowledge of a cookbook and you know teaspoon measurements and how many minutes and so on is a whole paradigm shift. So, so we did the kitchen testing, uh, Leila, the lion's share of it, uh, and, and, and from the recipes we received in interviews with these different, mostly women, some men, uh, we documented and 
wrote down and sort of formalized those recipes, which uh, was a real labor of love for the, the this Gazan cuisine. A lot of people have told us that they're really pleased to see these recipes that nobody's ever heard about now, sort of documented forever. And for us, it was important to recognize that body of folk knowledge that's mostly in the hands of women, never really acknowledge, I mean, everyone's proud of their food, but it never sort of makes the leap into what gets recognized as knowledge. And, and sort of acknowledge that body of knowledge as knowledge and write it down, it sort of uh, recognizes its dignity and its, and its importance to generations and generations. Um, so that was one of the kind of legs of, of what we were doing. Sorry about that. Another was the photographic documentary part, as you see in this photo. It was important to us to document absolutely mundane spaces, the, the absolutely ordinary. Um, kitchen sinks, There's a lot of documentary style photography throughout the book. The point wasn't to make it this, I mean, it was to be a beautiful book, but not in the <laughs> sense of like sort of these really photo finished, uh, you know, images of what we call sort of food porn. I mean, it was sort of, it's very ethnographic documentary in nature <laughs> to give you a real sense of like ordinary life and ordinary kitchens and markets and so on and so yeah. forth. And then also it was important to us to look, as we said, to trace some of those personal stories uh, and, and kind of pull on those threads and follow them, follow them upwards out from the, the, the immediacy of uh, how, how, how do you make a cauliflower stew to look at, well, how much does the meat cost and how much did it used to cost <laughs> and where does it come from and how does it get here and what is the conditions in the markets and speaking to individual households about their kind of home economy and then to shopkeepers and, and people in the marketplaces, to farmers, to aid workers, to, uh, to different NGOs that are trying to facilitate uh, some sustainability or some, some, just to keep Gaza fed under its present circumstances, and try to extrapolate sort of beginning from the micro level of these recipes and these individual households, extrapolate outwards and learn about the whole food system and therefore necessarily the whole political uh, circumstances of the, of the Gaza Strip what's happening there and intuit or, or begin to understand why. So we looked at industry. This, for example, is a picture of industry in Gaza is reduced to almost nothing, but this particular tiny factory was still operating. So here are the great machines that they had for, for toasting the sesame seeds and a, a whole interesting discussion about where do you get the sesame seeds from, how do they get through the borders, et cetera. You can, you can choose sort of almost any mundane ingredient and from that draw a very complete picture of, of what's happening in this tiny little part of the world that's so, so embattled and so uh, constantly under the, the magnifying glass of, of geopolitics. And so many issues, as Maggie talked about, I I'm just thinking in my mind, like, what's too political, what's not? But, but um, you know, I, like, you know, Maggie was saying, it's kind of uh, inescapably political, right? I mean, um, the food economy itself there, you know, we talk in the book how it's, Gaza itself is kind of an experiment in postmodern colonialism, but it is sort of one big social experiment in the sense that um, everything that goes in and out is rationed and calculated, and, uh, and it varies from week to week, and, uh, you know, and... Um, then you, there's this whole you know, uh, shadow government operating as well beyond the, the current government. You have the UN you know, and the UNRWA, and then you have the various aid groups and NGOs and uh, uh, the aid economy, you know, what's allowed in and what's allowed out and, and how many people are actually dependent on that and what, how they use those ingredients to then manufacture or create all kinds of new dishes and substitute certain ingredients and what access they have to what is available and, uh, you know, is a whole other issue. So we kind of weave together all these various uh, uh, stories uh, in the book. And um, I'm trying to think of one example. And, and with them, the, we also provide sort of profiles of individuals who tell their stories in the first person. So it's a, a, an attempt to, like I said, 
document and kind of formalize the recipes as knowledge and, and the peculiarity of Gazan cuisine, because as right, Leila said, right, it really right. is very different <laughs> from other regions of Palestine and very notably different from other parts of the greater region. So uh, really recognizing that and, and, and sharing that uh, with the world. And the ways, providing, we should probably mention some of the ways in uh, which it's different. Um, because we do, so what we try to do is, like we were saying, is we have the sort of documentary style photography, we have the profiles of the individuals and the various uh, text boxes and uh, you know, analyses of the political and economic situation and, and everything that entails. And then of course we have the recipes themselves. And um, some of what makes it so different is the way that it's absorbed certain ingredients, uh, amongst which are the use, extensive use of spice, uh, both actual spices and heat uh, uh, and the piquancy of the cuisine is very notable as well, mainly in the urban areas. Uh, much of Gaza, of course, is uh, rural or, or else descendants of, of uh, former uh, villages and, and so forth, and their cuisine is also very different. But it kind of uh, incorporates, it's a great place, we say, to experience the cuisine of sort of greater Palestine within the context of the small little tiny Gaza Strip because so many Palestinians came from elsewhere throughout historic Palestine to Gaza. So you have the piquancy and the heat of the urban areas and the sophistication and the extensive use of spices, which is, again, uh, an ode to Gaza's position uh, in ancient times along those trade routes. Um, and then you have uh, sort of the Mediterranean uh, flavors. You have the extensive use of dill and dill seeds and very lemony uh, sour flavors, which again dates back to sort of Abbasid times. Uh, sour pomegranates and lemons and uh, tamarind and, and all these various flavors. So it's a very urban, herby, vibrant, uh, uh, you know, piquant cuisine. Uh, but again, even in an area as small as Gaza, it varies greatly from like one mile to the next and people have very heated conversations about like this is not how they make it in in our village, uh, you know, or we would never dream of making sumagia. That's a Gaza City thing, and we never use, uh, you know, villagers would say to us frequently, we never use garlic. Ooh, garlic, you know, it makes your mouth smell. You know, us villagers only use onion, and so it was really remarkable how well preserved some of these traditions were, uh, just you know, from from one area to the next. No, it was. This was one of the things that really surprised us in the field work was how faithfully and sort of endogamically each village would reproduce. These are villages, many of them, that had been destroyed after or in 1948. And, and often the only trace left of them was, was the taste of them. And, and therefore you got a sense that, that people understood themselves as, uh, cooks, women, understood themselves as somehow the, keepers. the, the keepers, the safeguarders of, of the only little intangible heritage left of a village of which no stone is left, uh, no evidence is left, its name's not on the map, but uh, we know that we make lentils in this way, no? and, and, and that these recipes were being perpetuated uh, from one generation to the next in, in, in this way. And it was, a, it was very beautiful and very interesting to see that these are not first generation, these are second and third and sometimes fourth generation that are perpetuating these specific tastes of these specific villages and identifying them as as such, so that was one of the many surprises that uh, awaited us in the field work. The, in, right, the regional specificity of a lot of these these dishes, and in um, general, in the field work, it was shocking just how generous people were. I mean, we know we know that in this region, people are generous with food in general, and passionate about food in general, and proud of their food in general. But we felt like it was quite a lot. We were a little nervous when we set off to do the the field work because. Speaking to publishers with the idea in the United States, mostly we got from sort of more political publishing houses. They said, ah, how frivolous, a cookbook. Eh? And from more uh, cookbook publishing houses, they, they said, yee, Palestine, Gaza, very political. We don't want to touch it. So uh, we were nervous that we would get sort of similar responses from the, the people we approached in, in our field work. And on the contrary, uh, it was a sort of affirmation of our intuition when when we went, and as soon as we started asking people about food, they immediately understood that if we're asking about food, we're also really asking about, we're talking about 
family histories, human dignity, cultural uh, continuity, sustainability, the present economy, like in Gaza, everyone we spoke to about this really immediately captured the whole idea. We had to fend speak, off invitations. We did. We would be speaking to someone and suddenly there would be pouring, people would pop their heads out and let me offer you the best way to make this. Okra, this okra, no, you make yeah. okra like this. No, they do and then they would, yeah. Uh, it was incredible. And I mean, it really does speak to sort of, again, the very humanizing, you know, uh, aspect of all of this. Um, and we frequently say that, that Gaza is besieged with media. Uh, in addition to many other things. And um, people were always kind of bracing themselves to give us their rehearsed responses to whatever question they thought we were about to ask them. Uh, and we're really pleasantly surprised to find out that like, no, we actually want to know how, you know, you make mulchia. Um, mm -hmm. But again, with the understanding that all of, we're not like pretending that none of this exists, uh, but, but getting to there through a different, uh, a different window. Uh, as it were. And then, you know, I mentioned a lot of uh, how some of these dishes, some of their ingredients we noticed had changed over time. People frequently ask us about, like, how have people sort of adapted? And and um, and we, we like to say, uh, you know, that it, it's pretty remarkable how they have managed to adapt, uh, given sort of the impossible circumstances under, under which they live. And um, well, this is a good example. This is a mushroom cultivation uh, uh, facility that we went to, and of course, of course, mushrooms aren't ordinarily used in the cuisine, but uh, because of the very dire conditions and uh, the high rates of uh, food insecurity, uh, you know, many NGOs, along with the agricultural uh, uh, sector, were struggling of, for ways to, uh, in which uh, to to which in, through which to supplement the uh, people's inaccessibility to protein, right, like fresh meat and fish and so on. Uh, and so they came up with this idea of cultivating mushrooms and then using that as an income generation scheme for women and giving them little recipes, you know, to help them adapt to using, incorporating the mushroom in their, uh, in their food and so on. But one very obvious one also was the, uh, the, uh, the, I should say not the use, but the disuse uh, of olive oil, which is, of course is a, uh, one of the, the, the main fat, right, in Palestinian cuisine. Uh, now people, we noticed, m mainly were using it just to sort of drizzle or finish certain dishes. Uh, and that's due to the, again, uh, the large rates of food insecurity, the prohibitive, uh, uh, you know, price tag on the olive oil now, the, uh, the fact that so many of those groves, the trees were uprooted, and the inaccessibility, of course, between Gaza and the West Bank, where most of the olive trees grow. So people have now swapped soy oil, which is the oil distributed by Maine, much of the aid organizations, um, which of course, you know, aid distribution is intended for, for a short-term emergency, and in Gaza it's become a long-term thing. And then so that's just a whole other sort of can of worms. What happens, what's the impact of long-term aid distribution and dependence on a population uh, and how they eat? Another good example is, Maggie showed you the picture of those two brothers, um, uh, well, not that you would know their brothers, but they are, um, and they, they're sort of these entrepreneurs that established uh, the fish farming industry in Gaza. Uh, which again, why would you need fish farming in a coastal enclave? You know, you, you wouldn't. But again, due to the restrictions on the fishing zones off Gaza's coast, uh, they uh, became inventive, innovative, and this sort of, you know, took off. Uh, I'm always careful about my use of words. Blew up, <laughs> and the NGO uh, sector adopted this and very enthusiastically and began to buy the fish from them and distribute them to other uh, farms or, or NGOs to distribute to people, and. Um, and there are characteristic. I mean, we we we, we like these stories of uh, what the the sort of pop word in the world of NGOs these days is talking about resilience. I have a lot of ambivalence about the the this notion of resilience, but but we do like these stories of individuals who have found incredibly inventive ways to get around every obstacle that's put up. And these guys, besides being just very charming and very funny in themselves, I. Uh, so they turn up, they get giant electric uh, blackouts and they can't aerate the fish tanks and the fi fish will you know, suffocate for lack of oxygen. And so they invite all of the village kids to come over, uh, the, the kids from the neighborhood to come over and swim in the pool and splash. And they have splashing competitions for the kids and that aerates the, f f the pools and then the fish can breathe. Because there's so, like 12 hour you know, power outages in a row, so it wouldn't. So this sort of constant ability yeah. to, okay, this is the situation, how to, and, and being very much on their feet and coming up with solutions that, uh, that, that get around these obstacles. With joy, I mean, I love that example because it invite all the kids to come and have a splashing party. Like, 
it's not only getting around a really serious material limit to the infrastructural problem, but also with joy, with right. a sense of community, with like, let's have a splashing competition. So, uh, and, and, and we came again and again upon this kind of uh, inventiveness and, uh, and ingenuity. And uh, yeah, there are more things about these guys' story that are, are, are relevant, but uh, we should probably stop and give over the floor to questions, but we have many, many, many more we anecdotes. Can we <laughs> so we can know. keep going and going. But um, should, we, should we pass the floor to questions? This is an example of the aid distribution we're, we're talking about, which, again, uh, something like 75% of the population uh, is a participant in either the World Food Organization, the World Health Organization, whatever it is, UNRWA, there's you know, food vouchers and coupons and all this sort of you know, a whole intricate system network uh, through which aid is distributed, and there's constant questions as to whether, how the food aid packages should be changed. And I was shocked to discover in writing, you know, updating the second edition of the book that chickpeas were never included in the UN packages. That was, hmm. I was pretty floored by that. Um, hmm. That seemed like sort of a basic thing. Um, but again, a lot of it is white sugar, white flour, uh, you know, soy oil, these kinds of things. None of the nutritious kind of... With the corresponding nutritional problems right, that, right. that generates. Anyway, we should give the floor yeah. to, to questions. We're happy to, yes, please. Well, since there are two speakers, I can ask you questions. Yeah, sure. <laughs> for Layla, I, I, I really have to um, kind of uh, exonerate Anthony Bourdain, who I went to see here two weeks ago, who said he always gets asked about Andrew Zimmern. So ah. now I'm going to ask you about Anthony Bourdain. How is his cultural sensitivity? Because right. I take it that he's somebody who is very open-minded mm -hmm. and yeah. Really makes an effort to uh, right. give dignity to culture. Mm -hmm. And then for Maggie, um, Miami has an ethnic cuisine. Have you ever looked at Miami's ethnic cuisine? I mean, Miami has many ethnic cuisines. Cuban Chinese food. When mm -hmm. I tell people mm -hmm. about Cuban Chinese mm -hmm. food, and then just to ask both of you all, um, did people depend on like um, like home gardens? Mm -hmm. and, Yeah, those are great questions. So in regards to <laughs> Anthony Bourdain, yeah, I was a little like nervous at first. I didn't know what to expect. I thought, you know, I just knew of sort of his bad boy persona. And, um, and I should mention, I had uh, my two daughters with me and like my youngest was four months old and then my other was, I guess, five. And um, I had no one to help me. It, you know, I, I went there under really sort of arduous circumstances and I then was told to meet him at a location in Gaza City, and um, and I kept getting told by the producers like, no, don't, you can't bring the baby, and this and that, and come in your own car, and you know all the, and so I was getting really nervous that this would be a very unchild friendly operation, and he, you know, I immediately met him, and uh, and he, you know, and then my at one point in the, during the shooting, I had to take my baby with me to nurse her, and she was, you know, freaking out, and I didn't know what to do, and and I don't think people put two and two together, but that was her in the video. Uh, and he just picked her up and was like, just hushed her to sleep. And so, and he, and I was like, oh, okay then, you know. So, so that was fantastic. And he's like, I miss this age because his daughter was seven, I guess, at the time. And uh, so that was a real delight. And you're absolutely right in the sense that he's very comfortable, uh, you know, speaking not only about all topics but uh, respecting people and and you know their cultures and and having an open mind and open conversations. And uh, it was fantastic. It was a really special, unique opportunity, I think. Uh, and I'm so glad it happened at that precise moment in time. It would have been impossible a few months before and a few months after <laughs> due to all the border closures and so on. Um, so it was great. And I was able to take him to places I don't think they would have been able to get to otherwise. Uh, it was a really unique opportunity. And uh, I was really nervous about how or whether they would spin it sort of in a certain way at the end because I was only sort of part of one part of the whole uh, episode. But overall, I was you know, very pleased and very happy that... Uh, we had the chance to take him through. To get, the only part we didn't get to do was take him out into sea. Uh, we mm -hmm. were supposed to go out with some fishermen, uh, but they deemed it like too unsafe or something at the time. Um, but in regards to the home gardens and so forth, yeah, absolutely. We, we talk about that in the book, people not having not only dovecotes, but rabbit, there's little rabbit rearing operations. And, and of course, each one presents its own set of challenges, uh, access to water that isn't uh, completely um, you know, saline, um, or uh, being able to find, you know, the proper feed for, for chickens or, or whatever it is. Uh, th there's restrictions on what comes in and out to the strip uh, and, um, you know, the heat and so on and so forth. But certainly you'll find everyone, even if they have a small little 
strip of land will have something on their rooftop or if they have just a tiny little section of land will be growing something. But again, it is a very densely populated place with very limited space and not everyone has the luxury to be living in a building with a rooftop, obviously, but they do what, we can, what they can, I think. And part of the problem is that sometimes that knowledge isn't inherited uh, due to the sort of constant you know, uh, displacements, and, displacements and migrations and so forth. And so we were always uh, you know, very pleased to find certain cases where that knowledge was given from passed on from an uncle to a mother to, but oftentimes they just didn't know how to do this. And so they, in one particular case, they, one NGO or community center grouped together sort of grandmothers with, with younger women and the grandmothers kind of taught the younger women how to care for the rabbits and how to raise for them, raise them and so on. So yeah, lots and lots of, of micro sustainability initiatives. Um, and then a very much bigger debate at the level of the Ministry of Agriculture of how much to really push for sustainability because mm -hmm. any hope of sustainability in a territory like Gaza that is so tiny, so totally lacking in water. I mean, the big crisis there is countdown mm -hmm. to doomsday in terms of water. There is no water. They've over uh, the the aquifer yeah, of the whole water, region has been overdrawn. The saline water is entering from the sea. Like you could push for sustainability, but a the territory is just not big enough to ever provide the calories that that population needs, and b at great, like the more agriculture you do, the more risk of overdrawing the aquifer you are. So there are lots of different parameters. So on an individual like household level, everybody's drawing on every resource they can to raise pigeons, to raise rabbits, to grow mushrooms in the closets, to grow you know, herbs in barrels. don't you feel like, barrels. I sometimes feel the average American household can learn so much from Absolutely. Aduna or whoever. There was this Absolutely. one woman we visited who in a tiny little space like, cooked up a storm, like a three-course meal, and you know, is... the gray water from washing the, the parsley uh, went to, to her garden, and the, and the parsley stalks went to the chickens outdoors, and, and you know, everything was done in a completely uh, sustainable way in this one-woman operation, and it's just incredible. Absolutely, um, so yeah. And as for the uh, Cuban Chinese, I'd love to go back and, and, and do this kind of ethnographic work in Miami. I left Miami when I was 13, so I've never really lived there as an adult, but, but one, one of these days I'll go back to Miami and, and do something like this because it really is an unbelievably rich, weird, idiosyncratic, interesting place. <laughs> I lived on South Beach for five years. So. There's a lot going on there. In any, any, any city block, there's a, a lot of stories to tell in Miami. <laughs> Other questions? Yes? Of course. Um, very roughly, I mean, there, there are lots of different regional differences, even, even within Gaza, as Leila was saying, like right. between families that are originally of the sort of farming village interior, the hill towns, families that are from the coastal, the sort of more urban coastal places. Like there are even, even within Gaza, there, there are very striking differences. But in, in the north of Palestine, for example, uh, there's much more use of yogurts. Uh, they do not like spicy food, like spicy in the sense of hot. Uh, at all. There's, in general, a much le lesser use of all kinds of spices, both aromatic spices and like spicy hot spices, and a lot of use of, of, of yogurts. It's much more similar to the Lebanese or... Uh, it seems to be like a north-south thing, doesn't it? A north-south <laughs> thing. Um, I mean, the most obvious example, if I was to give you like one example, it's sort of the most stereotypical, but it, but it does hold true, is the use of the chili pepper. So they use a lot of chili peppers in, in the Gaza region, uh, both in green form and sun-dried form, you know, chili flakes and, and chili sauce and all sorts of things. And there's a really famous uh, pounded salad, similar to a salsa almost, I would say, uh, called salata ghazawi, a Gazan salad, or degga, which means pounded. That's made with uh, dill, uh, tomatoes, uh, garlic or onions, depending on who you speak to, another very heated debate, that, as we learned, uh, and then chili pepper, green chili pepper, very fiery hot chili peppers that seem to be sort of an indigenous variety, uh, recent indigenous variety, obviously before it came from the Americas. But that's one obvious example. Again, others, Falahin, will tell you we don't, they, they don't, they're not very fond of the chili pepper. Uh, their tradition was one of more, much more mild seasonal uh, flavors, uh, root vegetables, and borgol and frica, and things like that. Uh, but the chili pepper and, and then dill, the extensive use of dill in green form, and then dill seed as well, 
um, is used, uh, yeah, sorry? No, dill, dill, like uh, dill, dill weed or dill greens. Ah, uh, what is it in Arabic? Okay, in Egypt and elsewhere they call it shabat. In Gaza they call it, they call it jarada. And uh, yeah, and the dill seed is called ayn jarada, right? Leave it, leave it to the <laughs> Palestinians with their sixth sense of humor. That means locust eye. So <laughs> it looks like I know, right? And um, yeah, they use that a lot. Uh, the other thing I would say is, um, I'm trying to think off the top of my head. And also seafood. I mean, the right. The, that was what I was going to mention. Right. Gaza, the, Gaza is the last little yeah. piece of of what <clears throat> is presently Palestine that has access to the right. sea. So uh, there is a historic seafood cuisine in in the region, but very few Palestinians in the region presently have access to 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 the sea. Um, Gaza has man maintained a lot of the sort of high-end, very elaborate, you know, stuffed and rolled and fried and breaded, these sort of very, very elaborate, very uh, sophisticated seafood cuisine is actually from Jaffa. Mm -hmm. uh, Jaffa was the great sort of city, uh, cosmopolitan city on the sea and of many of pre-48 Palestine. And many Palestine. of those Palestinians from Jaffa came by sea, fled to Gaza in 1948, so and then ended up there, yeah. So it's a very significant uh, Jaffa population in Gaza, and they've really maintained that, that seafood cuisine and those seafood traditions. Um, so, yeah, the... Everything and you talk to... Calamari, you know, octopus, all sorts of things you'll find that there. You, you, you talk to Palestinians from the West Bank and in Israel, et cetera, and many from before the borders were closed, many have these sort of romantic memories of going to the beach at Gaza and having the seafood at Gaza, and it was like a thing that you went down to Gaza to go to the beach and, and eat seafood, that that was, a, that was you know, a lovely family Sunday uh, for, for many years until the borders were closed. So uh, it's, it's very famous for its seafood, and, and, and rightly so because it's spectacular. There's also a lot of these you know, dishes that we never knew quite how to categorize them. <laughs> Mush bowls, but Mush. <laughs> no, they're not. Come on, give them their due. They're they're very nice, but they're basically like one pot. Like they're cooked in one pot and um, and made with either a green uh, or a pulse. Like you know, sumagi is a good one. It's made with chard, chickpeas, uh, lamb meat, usually at the Eid, thickened with tahina uh, and sumac tartness from the sumac uh, berry, and then kind of all cooked together until it thickens, poured into bowls and then eaten with bread or distributed to family. And there's others, Rumania, there's, you know, Fugaya, and they're all cooked, poured into bowls, uh, you know, allowed to kind of uh, congeal, and then eaten. That's something that seems to be scooped up, scooped up a... with bread. That seems to be peculiar, you know, or unique to that uh, area uh, as well. The what? Ah, uh, right, yeah, absolutely, yeah. It's, it's Egyptian-type pronunciation in, in Gaza, it's more... No, is it? No. No, it's not, that's different. No, in Egypt, it's, uh, no, in... Yeah, the it's the jim. It's the jim in Egypt. In Gaza, it's yeah. yeah. But they dakka becomes dagga. Sumaqiya becomes sumagiya. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Ah, right. Yeah. Mm. This was yeah. a big debate. <laughs> we we were all the time sort of going back and forth between yeah. a sort of a ideal of memory of like how things were supposed to be like really this should be made mm -hmm. with barley really this should be made with furika uh, but now we make it with you know imported FAO sh short grain rice or, or this kind of uh, uh, substitution so we try to represent both in some cases we specifically say like this is a dish of memory that should be done like this but none of these ingredients are presently available like for the most part we, or, we no, no, for the most exactly. part, we, we, no, we include the original version of the dish. But then just for the sake of sort of representing this, uh, you know, this reality, we include like two or three recipes that emerged in the aftermath of 1948, either during the exodus itself or that continue to be made, very simple dishes that, and we, just, we say this emerged, you know, and is, was created through sort of patchwork of, you know, ingredients and, and whatnot. No, but we, we do include the authentic. We do. We have we have several recipes, right? So um, 
you know, we there are a couple of recipes too that are sort of in disuse that are no longer made or, or not very frequently from certain, like from Bir Sebe and other places, sort of ceremonial dishes that we thought were really interesting to record sort of, you know, for historical reference, um, but that most people, because there aren't these big gatherings in Bir Sebe in Gaza, right, don't make. But one example is, is Jrishit Bir Sebe, which is eaten like a feta. It's made with burgul, but it's eaten like feta in a big platter and everyone kind of gets around it. It's made with wheat during the wheat harvest. Uh, so we include a few references to dishes like that, but for the most part, we try to sort of remain true to the original versions of the recipe. Yeah. One more oh, question. Are we done? Well, while we're waiting for questions, I was going to mention one more thing that is, that is unique to the way dishes are prepared in Gaza, is the extensive use of the zubdiya, the mortar and pestle, that, uh, I don't know if we have a picture of it here, that is fashioned from this really rich uh, red clay, and... Um, You'll see mortars and pestles obviously throughout the world and elsewhere in Palestine, but, but what makes this unique is again, it's, it's made from clay with a lemon wood pestle. It's used to prep ingredients, it's used to cook in, it's used to, it's used to serve uh, the dishes in, and you, it's ubiquitous, absolutely ubiquitous. You'll see it in every household. Families retain it for generations and, and consider it sort of a member of their family, and we thought that was really uh, kind of a lovely little anecdote. <laughs> I'm sure we do, but I don't know what it is. <laughs> it's a bit hard, ah, right. And then you have the fire, and then you put in a clay pot the rice. Ah, uh, yes, gidra. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, idra. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Of course, we have that. That was sort of one of the first ones I mentioned. And I know there's debate about yeah. And we never claim that a particular dish is like only exclusively made in Gaza. You know, obviously that would that would be absolutely uh, absurd. And so we do mention that this is made in Hebron and made elsewhere. And in Gaza, they have their own spin on it. But it's certainly kind of the go-to ceremonial dish for weddings and funerals and and uh, this sort of thing, uh, aqiqa, you know, birth ceremonies and so on. And it used to be made. Uh, in the way that you mentioned, and when, when we went and did the field work, we found one remaining uh, uh, oven, right, like a community oven, where they were still made in these big clay vessels and, fire, and placed in a, in a brick oven, I, su I suppose. And that's still going, based on my most recent you know, contact with, with the family there. Um, but for the most part, it's not made in the very traditional way anymore. Uh, uh, people usually take, will take the meat to the oven and say, can you make me enough for 200 people for this party, and they'll give them to them in little foil packets and, and so on. It's not the same. No, I, it is, well, this oven is really good, though. I, this is the one remaining oven that does it in the, sort of in the, in the clay vessel still, in the way, and they pour the samna baladiya on top, the ghee, and so this is actually awfully good. Uh, but you really have to go out, I think, to the uh, more remote areas of the Gaza Strip and the, and the Bedouin areas to find them doing the fire pit thing. And they'll do, a good example of that is the dish that they showed on the Anthony Bourdain show, Fatte Tajir. And a lot of the, uh, you know, descendants of, you know, Bir Sabi inhabitants or some of the uh, Bedouin clans will still make those dishes in the fire pit and so forth. But not in the city. <laughs> Right. And yeah. They come with, uh, uh, knock out the clay. Yeah. It's yes. It's fantastic. Yeah. It's they do this. They do break this, these too. These yeah. these urns are made to be broken. So they. Yeah, yeah, they, yeah. Uh, yeah. But yeah, this is now a this is a, a commercial oven that these these uh, urns that you see they they fill them with the rice, the meat, the spices, and then and then they cook slowly in uh, right. in a stone oven which produces a sort of similar do, effect to the it, yeah. embers in the ground. Yeah. And then and then as a serving thing they break it yeah, open. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's incredible. All right, thank yeah, you. You're making us hungry. <laughs> <laughs> it's lunch time. Thank you very much. And we have the book at the end of the program for anybody who wants to buy it. I hope they are here. <laughs> they are oh are they? Yes, we have ah, okay, great. Yes. Oh, okay. The, the Fantastic. Topic. Please. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you, and we're happy to entertain more questions. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.